Okay. Hello. Good to be with you all again. So last time I left you, the United States had just won the First World War, but was very uneasy with the peace. Um, you know, the U.S. Is a, is a very conflicted country when it comes to foreign policy. Um, at our founding, our uh, first president, George Washington, had warned everyone, stay out of entangling alliances. Don't ally yourselves with Britain or France in this great struggle for European affairs. Europe, you know, it's the, it's the uh, land of kingdoms, these old ancient ethnic rivalries, you know, you have to understand that Washington, Madison, Jefferson, these the, the men of that generation, they knew their history. And in the late 1790s, they knew that ever since 1066, Britain and France had practically been at a virtual state of constant conflict for 800 years. And they said, well, there's no reason why that should ever end anytime soon. It's very interesting that um, Washington wouldn't live to see this, but certainly Jefferson would and Madison would and several others. 1815 is the last time Britain and France had a war. They made peace after the fall of Napoleon, and then Europe became a rather peaceful continent, at least for 100 years. And when war does emerge again, it's not Britain and France that go to war, it's Britain and France go to war with Germany, this new rising power. U.S. is very conflicted about this. We get involved, but almost immediately we re regret it. Um, many people thought in 1917 that the collapse of Britain and France was imminent, and when the U.S. enters the war, it's almost over before we can even get all of our soldiers onto the continent. And it sort of seemed like ah, Britain used us. Um, there was this famous saying in, in America in the teens, 20s and 30s, and even when World War II began, and that's that, you know, Britain is a very brave country and they will fight to the last American, meaning that Britain was sneaky. They would try to guilt us or trick us into coming and rescuing them because of these old uh, you know, ethnic bonds we had of, you know, the English coming and founding the, the colonies, that we speak the same language, same political system, and that they would play on that and play the Germans up as this foreign evil entity. And you know, in 1919 and 1920, that seemed to not be that crazy that they had manipulated us in, into it. Um, we vote for Warren Harding in 1920. It's the most lopsided election of the last 200 years, you have to go all the way back to James Monroe in the 1820s to find one that was that lopsided. Americans rejected progressivism at home because of all the strikes and race riots and everything of 1919, but also interventionism abroad. The U.S. seems okay with bossing around Latin American countries and conquering um, you know, the Philippines and, and Guam and Hawaii and the Pacific, but people are very uneasy about us taking a, an active and progressive role on the European continent with countries that are as strong as us. And so we turn our back on them. Um, the 20s are a very exciting time. They're often misremembered. And I think it's a very good um, analogy for what's going on today. The 1920s saw sort of America at war with itself. After making peace with the Europeans, we retreated into our own selves, into kind of a cocoon. We largely cut off trade with European nations, setting up the highest tariffs anybody had ever seen. Um, the Neutrality Acts of the 1930s would not allow the U.S. to uh, loan money to belligerent countries, countries in a state of war. We shut off immigration to almost nothing in 1921. Um, it was largely a rejection of foreigners, immigrants, and any outside influences, but that wasn't universal, um, meaning in big cities, there still were many, many uh, immigrants and sons and daughters of immigrants who had come to the country in the last 40 years from the 1880s. And uh, you saw this huge divide between urban and rural. 1920 is the very first census where there are the same number of Americans living in rural areas as urban areas. Now, this is a very frightening thing to some people. And it still is today. If you wanna know today, what are the best predictors? Like if you just have like a box, like an you know, unknown, this person, we won't tell you anything about them, but one thing and try to predict how they will vote. Race tells you a lot, gender tells you a lot, income level tells you a lot, region of the country you live in tells you a lot, religiosity, how often you go to church or if you go to church at all tells you a lot. But honestly, the best predictor of all is do you live in an urban area or a rural area? What's your population density? And once it gets over a certain level, it's almost certain you're a very liberal person. You know, you think of these liberal areas, San Francisco, New York, you know, 
Los Angeles, very, very liberal places. The very conservative places are out in very rural communities. Now in 1920, this process had been going on 100 years of industrialization and everyone could see the trend, right? And in 1790, our very first census, only 5% of Americans lived in urban areas. Hardly anyone at all lived in urban experience. We were farmers. By uh, 1820, that largely hadn't changed. It was still only about 10% or so. Modern urbanization, or a mild urbanization, I should say. Fast forward 100 years to 1920, half of Americans lived in cities, and it looked like there was going to be no stop to this. We were going to continue to industrialize, and people would continue to move to cities, and small town folk felt that they were under siege, that their lives were, you know, the lives of their children were going to be altered forever, that that small town rural life was going to disappear at some point, and everything they hated was in big cities. Big cities were disproportionately immigrant, disproportionately non-Protestant, disproportionately African-American. And they were people in small towns were terrified. And so you see this kind of culture clash. A lot of people call it the Roaring Twenties. You know, you got flappers and you know um, uh, speakeasies, and people were dancing and partying and having fun. It was a very liberal time. Yes and no. Uh, if you actually look at the laws on the books and the political parties in power and some of the policies passed, uh, it was a very conservative time. After all, alcohol was completely illegal. Um, not only had we never attempted to do that before, but no advanced country on earth had ever thought of completely banning alcohol. If you talk to Europeans, they just think you're crazy. The very famous Prime Minister Winston Churchill uh, said that uh, prohibition was this, you know, horrible, awful, sort of demonic thing. Winston Churchill certainly liked his alcohol. Um, sorry, I forgot to share my screen. Now I am. Um, so we think of the 20s as the modern woman the flapper, the independent woman. Uh, and in some instances, that's true, but this is a site that you would see in big cities. You would not see it in rural America, which was still very, very conservative and at war with itself, essentially. Before we get to that social stuff, though, let's talk a bit about economics. So the 20s, uh, it's an interesting time because the economy explodes in the 20s between uh, 19, really, 1923 and 1929, the economy exploded. There was a bit of a recession, people forget, but from 1919 to about 1922, the economy tanked, largely because you spent so much money in World War I, and then you cut off that deficit spending and hurt some of those businesses. Um, and um, also, uh, during wartime, during World War I, farmers were doing well because everybody else stopped producing grain because they drafted all their farm boys from rural areas to go fight at the front. The US had such a large population, we didn't have to do that. We fed the world, demand was high for grain, we made a fortune. When the war was over, everyone started producing grain again and, and prices just collapsed in the 20s and farmers were hurting real bad. Um, we cut off immigration in 1921, virtually no one could get into the US anymore. And um, yet, without any increase in the labor force for those eight or nine years after World War I, the economy exploded. This is because of technology. Technological output allowed the labor force to produce more things because new inventions came out. So um, electricity pretty much completely replaced steam in the 20s. Now, electricity had been around um, in some form or another since the 1870s. Uh, really the 1890s is when it's safe and you have electrical lighting and stuff like that and, and factories are run on machine. By the 20s, most Americans, at least in urban areas, have electricity in their own homes. They have electric lighting. Some of them start to have refrigerators. Before that, you would just have ice boxes where it was just kind of like when you guys go to you know cookouts or barbecues and you have a little igloo that you throw ice in. Um, it was like that, but it looked like a fridge. It stood up and you get a big block of ice delivered to your front door. And, you know, for a week or so, it would stay in there and keep things cool. Then modern refrigeration came out in the 20s and middle class people started buying refrigerators. General Electric started producing them. Probably the greatest invention of all at this time was the radio. Blue people's minds. In 1920, this invention comes out. The British invented it. Um, at the tail end of World War One, really in 1919, to better communicate with like pilots in the air with ground forces. It comes online a little too late to win the war, but what a technology. I know this is a very, very, very old technology to you guys. It's a hundred years old at this point and no one really use, I mean, I use my radio in my car, but everyone's using, you know, um, geez, whatever. 
apps that you guys use. I forget the names of them, but um, the ones where you can pick your song list and all that kind of stuff, you know, not iTunes, but Pandora, whatever, you know, Spotify. Um, people by and large don't really listen to the radio anymore. We watch television or we, you know, watch things on the internet, but imagine going from a time period where there was print media and then all of a sudden you have this box in your home that would talk to you and, and you could talk to over a million people at once. It was amazing. It was liberating. Again, something really reserved for just people in cities. You broadcast, you know, bandwidth and whatnot did not allow you to really reach rural audiences, but urban people could get a radio and listen to it. Um, and it was amazing. Washing machines in your own home. Dryers don't come around until a little later, but you would pin the clothes up in, in the backyard and it was pretty cool. Sometimes a load of laundry would take housewives all day to do with the washboards and scrubbing it with a bar of soap and wringing it out and washing it. it. Took forever. Now you just throw it in the washing machine and then, you know, an hour later it's done. You throw, you, you pin it up. Later on, dryers come out. An hour later, it's done. It was wonderful. Automobile production explodes in the 20s. Henry Ford had been producing cars in the early 1900s, even before World War I. But um, the statistics here are extraordinary. If you uh, look at it here, in 1913, right before World War I, a single Model T from beginning of production to end of production took 13 hours to make. In 1925, 12 years later, that was decreased to 10 seconds, meaning not from beginning to end, but from one rolling off the line to the next one in the line. Every 10 seconds, a finished automobile came off the line uh, in Ford's uh, Detroit Motor factories, which was just extraordinary. When production escalates like that, prices come way down. The price of a Model T in the mid 1920s was a mere $300 which was very affordable. That was like, you know, a car for the every man and every woman. Uh, and if you don't have that money in the bank account, there's this new um, thing, consumer credit. Before the 1920s, it was very rare for individuals to borrow. Farmers would because they're technically business owners and they need to buy all this capital. But if you lived in a city and you worked for wages, you largely couldn't get into debt. Uh, you know, you might borrow money to buy a home, but people didn't have consumer loans. There were no credit cards before the 1920s. Uh, now there were, now there were. And some geniuses figured out that Americans want things. They don't wanna to wait to save up for them. And why not? Why not let them buy it on credit? They pay $300 and over the years with all the interest payments, it ends up probably being four or five or $600. You get a low monthly payment. You know, you're probably paying $12 a month for your automobile, something like that. It's affordable, why not? let people buy it. So this was uh, extraordinary. There were, um, do I have the statistic here? I forget exactly, but there was one um, Model T for every five, yeah, Americans. There were 26 million automobiles produced in the 20s, one for every five Americans. So what that basically meant is that the average American family had one car, which is not that great to us today. I mean, I'm sure some of you you live in homes where there's more cars than people. I grew up in a house like that where there was four of us, my mom, my dad, my brother, myself, yet we had five cars because my dad always wanted two. He wanted a commuter car and he kind of wanted a fun, you know, car he could work on and fix up. It's a little older, like a collector one. And so automobiles, have, you know, proliferated for, for a century, but this is the very kind of beginning of them. When they first came out, they were you know, sort of a recreational thing. You would go for a drive for recreation if you were a very wealthy person. You get your goggles and your little Kangol hat, your scarf and your driving gloves and you go out for a drive. There weren't too many roads and certainly no highways that link things together. It was just kind of a fun thing. In the 20s they are being used for transportation and now the country's getting crisscrossed with roads. There's no national highway system yet. People take trains to cross the country, but if you're driving within a city, then you drive your own car. Now people could live further away from work and commute. It was a very liberating thing and it changed everything. More on that later. Um, so production just skyrockets. If you look at some of these uh, factory plants like a, a, a Ford or a GM plant, um, everything was run on electricity. You had these pneumatic wrenches like air powered ones where electricity you know, powers a compressor and you have a, you know, a, a sort of a charge of compressed air there that you can release with the squeezing of the trigger and then it tightens a bolt on you know one part of the car so henry ford pioneered uh he's very misunderstood people 
imagine that he invented the car. He didn't invent the car, but he was a genius at taking a very complicated thing and sort of disassembling it in his mind and figuring out the fastest way to put it together. This is why they went to him in World War II, because by the end of the war, Henry Ford's factories were producing a bomber, and a bomber had 1.5 million parts, V-17. Uh, every hour, every 63 minutes, a bomber was produced in these factories. And so Germany and Japan just couldn't keep up with that kind of quantity. Notice how very American this type of production is. Henry Ford made one type of car. All of them were black. They were identical to each other, no frills. It wasn't like, oh, here's the deluxe package, here's the regular one. No, they were all identical because he wanted to flood the market in quantity. His competitors, General Motors, um, decided that they couldn't compete with the quantity of Henry Ford. So they made like three levels of car, right? They made Chevrolet, which was, you know, um, uh, kind of the middle level, right? It had a few, you know, frills and stuff like that. Buick was at the very bottom and at the top was Cadillac, right? You still probably hear that today. This is the Cadillac of cell phones or whatever, because Cadillac was the nicest level of car you could buy at General Motors. And it meant that you stood apart from everyone else of this sort of keeping up with the Joneses kind of uh, thing in America. You want to buy goods, not just for yourself, but to show off to your neighbors how comfortable you are. So this fed into consumer culture and it became this, this huge thing in America. Now, um, there certainly was a downside to this. It became open season on unions all during this time period. Unionism spiked in 1919, but because of the backlash against all the strikes, the Republican administrations of Harding and then Coolidge and then Hoover made it harder and harder and harder for unions to form to get what they wanted. Government would side with corporations. Republican party was very favorable towards them and union membership just plummeted. It went from 5 million in 1920 down to three and a half million in 1926 and it would bottom out in 1932. Once Franklin Roosevelt becomes president, it would then surge and go back up to over 10 million. But unions were not doing well at this time because the administrations were just not for it. Because of car production, it changed other aspects of the economy. It seems very weird, but there was a time in America where there were no gas stations, just none, because there were no cars. Everybody got around on trains or before that horses. And so there weren't gas stations. Now that there's cars, people have to fuel them. You don't want to have people run out of gas in various places and get stranded. So now petroleum stations start opening up all over America. They just litter the countryside. They're all over the place. You guys know that if you get on any street and just drive, you're going to hit a gas station every half mile, pretty much. Um, Sometimes it's scary when you're out, you know, driving to Vegas and you're on the 15 and there's 50 miles in between gas stations. But by and large, that's our country today. You guys are young enough where you probably will see the end of that. I just read the other day that General Motors by 2035 will have no more gas consuming cars. It'll be all electric. Probably the other auto manufacturers will follow suit. I hope it's not too late in terms of battling global warming. But the point is, you guys will see the end of the gas station probably when you're in your 50s and 60s, you'll have to tell your grandkids like what gas stations were and how, you know, we go to Dodger Stadium on the weekends and we'd stop by the gas station and fuel up and then you go get your candy and stuff for the road trip and your kids and grandkids will look at you like whatever old man, whatever old woman, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, gas stations are, you know, a vestige of, of having cars around. And of course, these secondary industries, glass production skyrocketed, rubber production skyrocketed, uh, petroleum production skyrocketed. Uh, Texas and, and Oklahoma had these huge economic booms because they were the only known sources of petroleum, mostly. And then the U.S. discovered it in Venezuela and in the Middle East to, to fuel this consumption. But it was uh, incredible. So let's talk about um, more of these economic developments and then some of the cultural things that develop here. So um, first, uh, as I said, 1920 was the first census where there's more people are about equal in urban areas than in rural. America was evenly divided down the middle and both sides didn't like the other, right? What, what are the stereotypes we as urban people have about rural people is that they're poor, they're ignorant, um, they love guns, they're you know way too religious, many people think. Um, these are stereotypes and they're not all true, but you know, people imagine that they are. And that was the same in the 20s. Likewise, people in rural areas seem to think that they're more traditional. They're the you know, true lineage of what America was and is, and that these people in cities are foreigners by and large, immoral people, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and so there's this huge divide between the two and very antagonistic. Big influences on urbanization. New York City became the largest city on earth in 1898 when it incorporated the, the five boroughs of New York City used to be uh, separate cities. And then they unified in 1898 and overnight New York City became the largest city on earth. It's really amazing when you think about it. New York City in 1776 was not even the largest city in the United States. It was probably the third or fourth largest. It was first Philadelphia and then Boston and Baltimore. And then New York was a bit behind that. After the Erie Canal was constructed in 1823 and open traffic accelerated into New York, you know, uh, waterborne traffic, uh, shipping. And then population explodes. By 1860, there's a million people in New York City by the time of the Civil War. By 1898, when incorporation of the five boroughs happens, five million people live there. And then the subways and the Brooklyn Bridge have made it easier for people to live and work there. Uh, trolleys came about. You saw animals started to disappear after 1900 from city streets. Good thing you didn't have animal waste in the streets. You had electric trolleys. In fact, the, the team in Brooklyn that comes to Los Angeles, the Dodgers, many people don't know this. They were actually known as the trolley Dodgers. It referred to people who were like walking to work in the morning in, in Brooklyn and you're kind of late for work and you're running and you would like jump in and out of kind of this, this traffic, this uh, trolleys going along these trolley lines uh, to get to work so that you're not late. Um, so this made cities better places to live. Amazingly, Detroit was per capita, pound for pound, the richest city on earth, which shocks people today because Detroit is not doing so well. Um, this is because factories started to close down in the 70s and especially in the 80s and 90s and those factories moved largely to Mexico or China or other places where labor is much cheaper and it had a devastating effect on Detroit. But because of automobile production, Detroit was um, the second largest city in America and the, and the richest per capita, it was amazing. Um, one thing that's very interesting that uh, cars have an effect on that people don't quite realize is the very shape and design of our cities. I want you to kind of think of this. Cities that were built before the automobile are very tight and compact, right? Think of Boston or a more familiar city probably to you would be San Francisco. San Francisco is built largely in the 1870s. And if you guys have ever been to San Francisco, you can walk across the city. It doesn't take that long. In about a half a day, you could walk from you know one side to the other. Same thing in Boston. I've done this before. It's like it's not that much to say that you did it. Um, this is because you would have to walk wherever you went in those cities. You had like an apartment downtown, and every place you went to had to be within walking distance. The roads are not very wide in Boston. Um, if you ever driven in Boston, it's always ranked as the worst city in America to drive in because they have a lot of one-way streets, lanes are very narrow, and it's hard to get around because when they built it, they didn't think, oh, everyone's going to be driving around in cars. That wasn't thought of. Um, cities after the automobiles built, they're spread out. It takes forever. Like, would you guys ever try to walk across Los Angeles, go from like Boyle Heights or Pasadena all the way to the ocean? I mean, some people do this. My wife did it because she ran the uh, LA Marathon, but that's a marathon. It's 26 miles to cross the city. It's insane. Um, you can't really do that, especially in the summer. So you need a car, basically. Um, it was felt that, that traffic would be too much. And so city planners start to plan cities so that they're way spread apart. LA, Miami, San Diego, Seattle, Houston, these Denver, all these cities that come after the 1920s are spread out. Now, many architectural critics and everything say these cities are ugly, they're lifeless. I live in Cyprus, I kind of get it. It's like, uh, how do you know you live in Cyprus versus Buena Park versus La Palma? It's all the same. It's the same population density. You cross from one city to the next. There's no barriers. It, all the blocks are exactly half a mile long. All the streets are perpendicular to one another. Um, there's kind of a lifelessness. Um, I go for a walk every night. There's nothing to see on my walks. It's just other people's houses that you're walking past. It's you know not a very enjoyable experience. It's not like say you lived on Second Street in Long Beach. It's fun to go for a walk because there's people, there's businesses, there's you know a life to the city. Walking up and down Pine, right? That's where all the people gather because traffic is so tight. You have to ditch the car and get on foot. Orange County is not built for that. It was built after the car. Um, economically, farmers, as I told you, were absolutely hurting in the 20s. Production increased in other countries. Uh, prices of all these farm commodities uh, is going to tank. And that meant that farm workers were doing 
very, very poorly. I've told you guys this, that, that ever since the dawning of time, agricultural labor, because the nature of it, because if workers go on strike or refuse to work, you lose the crop for the year and then you have famines. Agricultural workers have never uh, been in an ideal situation. It's unfortunate, but it's just the truth. Whether it's talking about peasants or whether we're talking about slaves or whether we're talking about um, migrant workers today or farm workers in the 1920s, it was a pretty miserable existence. The average farm worker made $223 a year. The average industrial worker in a big city made about four times that, $870 a year. So much better to live in a city, right? Cities now in the 20s, hospitals proliferate. So people are born in hospitals starting in the 20s rather than at home. In the countryside, they're still born at home. People have toilets inside their homes uh, starting in the 1920s. They have electrical lighting. They have access to refrigerators and washer dryers and, and they don't have to chop wood to have a fire. They can you know, just go buy wood somewhere or have a, a gas fireplace. So cities were much better. Rural areas were hurting in the 20s. A very interesting time would start in the 20s and it largely fell apart in the last 10 years. And that's that there was a largely homogenous national culture, meaning radio was an interesting technology where there was a, a certain amount of bandwidth that you could have. There was a certain amount of stations you could produce. So government had to come in and regulate it, right? So for instance, if you're listening to regular radio, you can't have two stations broadcast on the same frequency, right? There can only be one power 106, right? 105.9, you can only have one of those because if two companies broadcast on that frequency, you can't hear anything, it's just static. So government would grant licenses. And it's very interesting. Countries like Britain say, this is such an awesome power. It's so powerful. We're gonna have government control it. And so they create a national corporation called the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation and government controls the airwaves. Americans have always been very afraid of that. That sounds like communism to us that the government will control what we can hear. And so we don't like that. And so we gave it to private companies. We licensed it and said, ABC, NBC and CBS will control it. They'll have affiliates in every town in America. But they basically started thinking there are certain cultural norms that are accepted and there's some that are very off-putting. And it's unfortunate, but it's very true. Here's what I mean. Southerners were told that their accent was very offensive to other people outside of the South and they just wouldn't listen to it. But the reverse was not true. Southerners will listen to, you know, Northerners uh, and not have a problem with that at all. Sorry. Um, so for instance, you know, uh, would you guys listen to uh, like a talk show or a news program if the, um, if the broadcaster was, you know, someone like Larry the Cable Guy? I certainly wouldn't. Um, it's, sorry, hang on a second. There we go. I routed my phone through my computer and people are texting me right now and it keeps beeping, it's annoying me so I wanted to shut that off. Okay, there we go. Um, I, I've heard interviews with people like Ryan Seacrest who's all over the, the airwaves. He's from Atlanta, Georgia, wouldn't know that. And I remember in an interview, he said when he was very young, he decided I wanted to be in radio and television. And I decided that I had to shed the accent. So we took voice lessons to learn to have an accent where you couldn't identify where he was from. Stephen Colbert is from South Carolina. And he said he was about seven, eight years old. And he knew in the movies, the shorthand to tell people that a character was dumb was that they had a Southern accent, right? Look at cars. That's what they did to Tomator to make them seem stupid, right? That's what we largely do. It's unfair. And so what that meant was you turn on the radio in any corner of the country, had this kind of bland, standard Midwestern American accent, what's often called the Omaha accent, because Omaha, Nebraska is sort of the official American accent where you can't really tell where somebody's from. Californians have an accent. I know we like to think that we don't, but we do. New Yorkers do, New Englanders do, upper Midwesterners from Michigan do, Minnesota certainly does, Southerners do. But in the Midwest, a solid Midwest like Nebraska, Kansas, you can't really tell where people are from. So that became this national standard of accent. Um, everyone was watching the same programs. I was thinking about this, you know, a little while ago that because media is so split up, I could, you know, ask you guys in class, like, what's your favorite show? And we could go around, I could get 30 different answers. 
because media's just exploded and decentralized in the last 25 years. When I was a kid, most of us didn't even have cable in the early 90s. Most of us just had like two, four, five, seven, nine, 11, 13. That was it. And so we were all watching the same five, six shows. I, I still remember this in 1992 when I was 13 years old. Cheers had its last show. It was a very popular um, sitcom. And something like 120 million Americans watched that show, the, the very last show. All you had to do was sing like the first three lines of the cheer theme song and everybody would know that song because it was so popular. You couldn't do that with something today. You, you couldn't get a celebrity like a Babe Ruth today, I don't think. There are famous people that you guys will mention that I'm like, I've never even heard of that person. Um, just a couple weeks ago, my brother was telling me about this guy, PewDiePie. I had never heard of him in my life. Uh, and apparently he's, I guess, the biggest YouTuber or blogger in the planet or something like that. I don't know. Never heard of the guy before, like last week. There's this big divide between subcultures in America where they're not linked. There was this sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, a unique time, a glory age. But from the 20s to about the 90s in America, uh, mainstream media, because of technology being limited, was broadcast just a few different shows, just a few different forms of entertainment. And everybody knew what that was. Everybody in America knew who George Herman Ruth, Babe Ruth was. He was unmistakable. Everybody knew who he was. Most famous person in America probably at the time. Um, so uh, celebrity is this sort of modern invention. It seems very weird to us today, but it's true that there was a time where there weren't really famous people, like someone you would see on the street and go, oh, I know who that is because I saw them from somewhere else. Presidents and kings would have their pictures taken after photography and they'd be posted in the paper. That was about it. Actors were not really you know, looked up at. You had theater actors, but they'd have to perform every single night. There was no way to broadcast it. Starting in the teens and 20s, you had three forms of technology that working together really expanded the reach of, of modern media. The first would be the phonograph. We talked about that last time, right? Where you have people could record songs, mass produce them, and you could go into any store in America and buy that same record and have the same experience someone else would. What really amplified this was radio then. You could hear a song on the radio and they would tell you that was, you know, uh, Easy Living by uh, Billie Holiday, go out and buy the record. And you can go into your local store anywhere in America and buy that record. Third was film. Um, now, film was silent when it first came out, but starting in the 20s, I think 1927 was the first talkie where you could actually hear sound along with film, and that just launched people into superstardom. So Babe Ruth would often be interviewed uh, on the radio, but also on film. There wasn't TV yet, but you would film him, and then you'd go into movie theaters, and before your feature film, there would be newsreels. You'd see news about what was going on in the world, and they'd have celebrity interviews and stuff like that. Everyone in America knew who Babe Ruth was and he was just famous. So this is weird and unique is that there had never been this thing called celebrity before. And now because of technology, it's very weird. People think that they know people. How often have you heard the phrase or how often have you said, I love X, right? Lady Gaga, whoever, right? Um, you don't know them. We don't know these people, but we imagine we do because technology brings them into our homes. It's a very intimate thing. And so, it creates this weird concept where we look up to these people, right? Like you guys know the celebrity endorsement. Why would we ever go out and buy a product because someone who sings songs that we like likes the same product? It's weird, but we do. Babe Ruth was one of the first people to do this. He sold everything. He sold cigarettes. He sold alcohol. He sold hot dogs. He sold everything. Anyone asked him like, hey, say you use our product, pose with it, we'll take your picture and we'll give you, you know, $20,000, whatever it was, right? And you guys probably know now that many athletes make more off of royalties and endorsements than they do from playing. Uh, you know, LeBron James, I think he makes four or five times as much off of endorsing products than he actually does from playing. Is that good? Is that bad? It's not for me to say, but it's an interesting development that starts at this time. And man, you cannot stop it now. There's whole networks like TMZ and Perez Hilton and everything else. I don't even know if those exist anymore, but these gossip, you know, TV shows and programs, this all starts in the 20s with the New York Daily News. They're just magazines that are just, I think are pretty trashy, but, you know, National Enquirer and uh, a lot of these other ones, In Touch and Style, where all they are are just gossip, basically. They just are, you know, what, what are celebrities doing? There's no real news in it. 
but Americans are concerned with it. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of alarm about everyone's on their cell phones, no one's communicating. If you look at pictures of people on New York City subways in the 20s, they're not talking to each other. They have the newspaper out and they're reading about Babe Ruth and Jack Dempsey, the boxer, and Rudolph Valentino, the movie star. People have always been obsessed with celebrity life since the beginning. Um, okay, so I think we're good on that. Let's go to the next one. So um, some of the images of the 20s. One of the all-American phenomena that comes out of the 20s, like the cowboy or like, you know, the astronaut in the 1960s, um, the flapper became the symbol of the 20s. What was a flapper? A flapper was a young woman born after 1900 who, when she became an adult, she could vote. She wasn't completely uh, equal legally under the law. There was still a lot of discrimination legally against women at the time, but women could vote. That gave a huge charge to sort of the political self-esteem of the feminist movement, meaning women now were told, politically, you're the equal of men. You can run for office, uh, and there was a, a, a female congresswoman from Montana, Jeanette Rankin. She served something like 30 years in Congress. There were um, now women running for office. There were women voting. And so women said, well, I'm the equal of a man politically. Why can't I just make my own choices and do what I want? Another thing that very much fueled uh, the feminist movement was prohibition. It's very weird. Uh, culturally, People who were waspy Protestants born in America, they would drink, but they typically would drink at home. It was considered uncouth, like very not good for like men to go out and drink together in saloons. That was something that Irish and Italian immigrants did, and it was just not looked at as, as a very good thing. You know, men being loud and singing songs and, and getting into trouble and you know, getting in fist fights and bars. It was just uncouth, right? So Immigrant men and, and men were, you know, son, sons of uh, immigrants would drink in bars. Native born men typically would drink at home. But when you shut down all the saloons and you said no one can drink at all, uh, one thing I forgot to mention to you is that these saloons were always men only, always, always, always. Like women weren't not allowed to set foot in a saloon. It was thought it's no place for ladies. And a lot of it was guys just didn't want their wives around, you know? A lot of male bonding, guys just say, you know, no women allowed, just male bonding. We want to go out and have our own place, you know, like the E-Man Woman Haters Club, and the little rascals. Once you drove it underground and once alcohol was illegal and then speakeasy sort of the illegal bars opened up, they just said, well, if we're going to flaunt the rules, let's flaunt all of them, right? If, if, this, if the cops can come in and shut us down and send us all to jail, why don't we let the ladies in here as well? And so they did. Um, and women... Not all of them, certainly, but many women, very daring at the time, um, would go out unaccompanied prior to the 20s. It was still the Victorian or the Edwardian era. And for at least Protestant, native born, middle class women, you did not go out on dates alone. But usually, a gentleman who wanted to court you, the phrase was at the time, would ask your father, May I take your daughter out on a date? Father would say yes or no. And then father would arrange for a chaperone for that date either the father himself or an older brother or a cousin or something would drive the young couple out, sit at the same table or sit in the car and wait for them to finish and chaperone them both, you know, there and back, which just seems bizarre to us today, but that was the way it was. Women were this sort of protected class, like Rapunzel locked up in a castle and weren't really allowed out without some sort of male chaperone. Women in the twenties, because they could now vote and because they were going out and drinking on their own, stop this practice and it shocked people very much so that independent women were going out and doing this there were all these horrible standards that women had to live up to where men could go out and philander and have all these affairs when they were young men but then finally settle down one day but women this is really terrible i hate this but if you were known to have had a sexual relationship with a man before he was married before you were married, and then you broke it off and you tried to marry someone else, your reputation would get around and people would say you're, quote, damaged goods. Imagine that. Women referred to as property, which legally they still were in many senses. And so this, it didn't come down overnight, but women are now pushing back against this, going out on their own to drink, going out on their own on dates, and just saying, you know what, if you like me, ask me out. Don't go to, um, you know, my father or my brother and ask me out. It's very interesting, but um, 
I often wonder about, uh, you know, gender equality and how far we've come because I still will ask uh, women today, young women today and say, you know, how would you feel if uh, you lived in a society where men didn't ask you out as much, where it was kind of equal? And it's very interesting. A lot of young women I talk to are still of the mind, you know, no, a man needs to ask me out. It's too aggressive and forward. And it's like, well, why? If everybody's equal, why couldn't a young woman ask a man out? We still have a lot of these ideas about gender stereotypes even today. But nonetheless, um, women started to very aggressively push back against that. Absolutely so. There were other things that were affecting this as well. Um, and a lot of it comes down to World War I. One thing that I neglected to mention on World War I is that that was the first time ever that the federal government implemented a, a, a sex education program because young men, typically very healthy, um, the one thing that usually uh, will cause young men problems on the front lines is STDs, basically. And so there were big concerns that the federal government had because so many young men were coming from rural areas and were very ignorant, where they, on their questionnaires, they would be drafted and they'd say, okay, we have to ask you all these questions about your health, et cetera. One of the last questions there, they'd ask them two things. One, where do babies come from? Two, do you like girls? Because of course, this is a time period, of course, of rampant homophobia. Uh, homosexuals were not allowed in the military prior to the 1990s. And if you guys don't know, after the 1990s, it was don't ask, don't tell. You couldn't be asked that question if you were gay and you could be in the military, but you couldn't tell anyone and you'd be cut out. It's not until 2013 where gay people can serve out in the open, you know? Um, so, in the 20s, you had those two questions there, right? And so where do babies come from? A lot of young men, 18, 19 years old, would say, the stork, right? Uh, that's what my mom told me. And so they felt, we cannot take 3 million men and ship them to Europe and leave them in Paris, the most sexually liberated place in the world. This is going to be really bad. We have to teach them where babies come from. We have to teach them to be safe. And so they started having you know, sex ed and boot camp, basically. Um, they showed them how to use, you know, various forms of birth control, how to keep themselves safe. And they said, you know, don't fraternize with the French women, but, you know, men don't always listen to, uh, to those kind of commands. And so this sex ed program, it led to a decrease in STDs, which was good, but men didn't forget all that, you know, information. They went to Paris, they had fun. They were like, wow, you know, it's a totally different world. And if you guys don't know, Europe is very different. They're, they're the reverse of us in terms of entertainment, meaning in America, we, we have no problem with graphic violence. We can make these unbelievably disgusting horror movies, you know, torture movies and stuff like that and get an R rating, sometimes a PG-13. But if there's a, you know, a graphic sex scene involved, then, you know, X or R or even worse, right? Uh, Europeans are the opposite. And so they don't have any as many hangups about sex. It's very common to just turn on television and there's nudity and stuff like that. And they just have different mores than us. And Americans were exposed to that and they did not forget. They came home. And it's interesting when you look at kind of the history of um, like drag shows or um, burlesque shows, these kind of, you know, sort of sexual entertainment theater. The first ones that open are in 1919 and 1920 in New York City and San Francisco. And they were opened by GIs who had been to France. So that Europeanization of America is, is going to continue on into the 20s. The, those you know, forms of entertainment will continue in big cities. You know, I don't want to give the impression that they were all over the place, but there were a few corners of America where that was more acceptable. And it changed things. It changed the behavior uh, of Americans a lot. Um, the other thing is just rampant xenophobia, just rampant anti-immigrant sentiment in the 20s. It's very weird. Again, we imagine the 20s was this liberal, roaring, you know, time where everyone was drinking, having a good time. Alcohol was illegal. Alcohol consumption plummeted by 80% during the 20s. We imagine that everyone was drinking anyway. Some people were, um, but overall, actually, it really cut the alcohol consumption rate. There's a lot of people like me who every once in a while, I'll have a drink of alcohol but if you told me tomorrow, hey, it's a felony, I would be like, hey, you know, uh, I got a wife, I got a kid, I got a mortgage. I, you know, I can't risk getting in trouble for that kind of stuff. And it's not that important to me anyway. No big deal. And that was most Americans. 80% just gave up alcohol entirely. 
It was that 20% though, who still went out, flaunted it. And it was very evident that if you wanted it, it was still available. It was all blamed on immigrants. Immigrants are flooding uh, our shores with alcohol. Uh, it, it was undermining our ability to run a democracy. And so, as I said in the prior lecture, the WCT and the Anti-Saloon League came up with these phony statistics that crime had dropped during the war, during the grain shortage, they got it banned during World War I, and then afterwards it was banned going forwards. The Volstead Act was uh, passed in 1919, along with the uh, 18th Amendment, basically banned alcohol almost entirely. Um, now, it was a failure largely because when you drive something underground, the normal way capitalism works doesn't work anymore, right? Like today, Budweiser and Miller do not go to war with each other because they're legitimate businesses. They can make money out in the open. But once you have illegal gangs controlling the alcohol trade, A, they have tons of money. B, they can't go to the cops. You can't go to the police and say, hi, I'm a bootlegger and I import alcohol illegally. And this rival gang came into my storage facility and stole 200 barrels of really good beer. I'd like you to arrest them. The cops are going to arrest you, right? You can't do that. So what do you do? You buy a Thompson submachine gun and you go after your opponents. And so there were, it, amazingly, the WCTU said crime will drop. Let's ban alcohol. And crime skyrocketed in the 20s. The murder rate went off the charts. The worst city of all was Chicago. The gang wars in Chicago in the mid 20s are just atrocious. Nobody has seen anything like that. Um, you know, 20 people getting gunned down uh, in one of these basically illegal drug trades where you'd have a bunch of guys meet at a warehouse in the middle of the night to buy the alcohol, the deal goes bad, and then there's just a massacre, 25 people killed in a single night. It was a failure. It was deemed a failure by the early 30s, and eventually prohibition would be repealed. But a large part of it was xenophobia. It was it's immigrants' fault. We need to kick them around. We need to stop them from organizing politically in these saloons. And so not only was alcohol banned, but, but immigrants themselves were not allowed into the country anymore. In 1921, immigration was cut off to a, a trickle. And then in 1924, it was even further restricted. Um, not only that, but the Supreme Court starts to um, change our naturalization laws. The Chinese Exclusion Act was still on the books. And it stated that in order to naturalize as an American citizen, you had to be, quote, white. And so the Supreme Court ruled on this and said, yes, this is fine under the law. So there were these uh, Asian immigrants who were living in Hawaii and California and Oregon on the West Coast, and they could never become American citizens because ethnically they just couldn't. Now, if their child was born in America, the 14th Amendment would make them citizens. But if you moved here, if you lived here for 50, 60 years, you could never naturalize because you weren't white under the law. So a very weird time in the 20s where you have this incredible liberal pushback, but very conservative laws on the books. How conservative was it? The KKK came back. Um, again, this was a terrorist organization of the 1860s and 1870s. It was crushed by Ulysses Grant. They used to do horrible uh, things to both black and white Republicans in the South, but they largely disappeared. When Reconstruction unraveled, they said, well, there's no reason to fight against it anymore. And so it sort of went away. Um, yes, there were lynchings, but it wasn't really performed by members of the Klan. It was just out and out in the community, just by regular people. What happened was in 1915, this huge movie came out called Birth of a Nation, B-O-N. It was basically a, a biopic. It was a, a, a history of uh, a white Southern family before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and afterwards. It was a three hour silent movie it's in the public domain now, so you can find it on YouTube if you guys are curious about this, but this was considered the greatest movie of all time at the time. It was, it, it's, and it's very divisive because in film schools today, people want to study it because it, nobody had ever shot at night with flares. They did that. Nobody had ever fought, filmed battle scenes before. They had huge numbers of extras. The movie cost $150,000 to make, which was the most expensive movie in the history of the world by far. But if you watch the film, it's an unbelievably racist film. The thesis of the movie basically is that the North was vengeful after Reconstruction, that they used the freed people of the South, African-Americans, to then take revenge on their former masters, um, that the freedmen ran around and chased after white women and abused them, um, and that 
they, African Americans, were unfit for office, that they took over the legislatures, they didn't know what they were doing, and they worked with white carpetbaggers to loot the South and be corrupt and steal money and all this kind of stuff. And then the KKK comes out and the music swells and they're the heroes. They bring back white Christian civilization. That's the movie. And it was huge. And people who were like, yeah, my granddaddy was in the Klan. Let me go get his robe out of the attic. They started to dress and come out almost like cosplay people today wearing stormtrooper outfits, going to Star Wars premieres. That's what it was like. People like wearing these KKK robes in the North in places like Philadelphia and Chicago and Portland, Oregon. People came out and cheered and screamed. It sort of mythologized the KKK into this bizarre thing that, that they were not, which was, you know, claiming they were heroes. And so Klan membership then skyrockets. They actually reform and say, okay, we're going to, you know, fight political battles again. Now, one might call this the KKK 2.0 because it's not a terrorist organization like it had been in the 1860s and 70s. They're sort of a normal political organization. They hold rallies, they organize people to vote, they organize boycotts. What were they against? They were against immigrants. So they said, keep the immigration quotas. They were for prohibition. Let's ban alcohol completely. They hated uh, black entertainment. So, you know, ragtime musicians, jazz musicians, they'd organize boycotts, you know, white listeners don't listen to jungle music, they would call it, and not so subtle uh, reminder that African Americans come from Africa and that they're from the jungle and, and all these awful, awful stereotypes and stuff. Um, and so that's what the KKK did in the 1920s. It peaked in 1924 at 3 million members, making it the third largest party in America after the Republican and the Democratic parties. It would dwindle in the late 20s and early 30s, but for a while there, it was the thing. If you were angry about your country going downhill, about immigrants taking over, about everything in 1919, you joined the KKK in the 20s. That's what you did. And sort of dovetailing with that was a huge revival in religious fundamentalism, Protestant fundamentalism. People don't even use the word fundamentalist today because it's got a very bad connotation. Um, it, uh, today, people would use the term evangelical. Um, what a fundamentalist is and what an evangelical is, is someone who gives a literal interpretation to the Bible, right? Um, it's very interesting, but like some Protestants and all Catholics take some stories in the Bible to be metaphorical, right? That, you know, probably the story of Adam and Eve is, is uh, an allegory or a metaphor. It probably didn't quite happen that way where Satan manifested himself as a serpent, but it's meant to teach a greater truth and that's okay. And it's not literal. Fundamentalists would say, no, everything in the Bible is true. Noah really got every species of animal onto a giant ark. And that literally happened, which if you look at it from a scientific standpoint, that doesn't really make sense. And it could not happen, right? It's like, if one boat carried all the animals and landed somewhere, how did all the kangaroos get down into uh, Australia? And how did you know all of the llamas get down into Peru? Like it doesn't quite make sense that that's the way that it happened, but people take this different ways. Religious fundamentalists felt very threatened by the theory of evolution. Now, why does this blow up in the 20s? Evolution had been around since 1859 is when Charles Darwin writes his theory. Most people weren't exposed to that. It was only a few scientists at college, but what happened in the 20s was universal high school. New England started to get high school for free in the 1890s. And then by the 1920s, every corner of the country had high school. Most African-Americans couldn't afford it. And one statistic I think I told you on the Jim Crow slide was that in the entire state of Florida, there were only four black high schools. Schools were not integrated back then. And so um, most people now could get a high school diploma and were exposed in their science classes to the ideas of Darwinism which Southerners pushed back at. They felt that their religion was under threat, that if you start saying this part of the Bible is untrue, it's a house of cards, it'll all collapse, and that we're all gonna worship science and scientists. And so there was this sort of climax of this, this fight between urban and rural in 1925 in a little town in Tennessee. It was the trial of the century, the Scopes monkey trial. John T. Scopes, young man, young teacher, 25 years old, taught a science class, a biology class, taught the theory of evolution. It was illegal. He was sentenced to pay a fine of $100. And many people in the North just shook their heads and said, can you believe this? There's only one thinking man in the entire town and he's being persecuted. So John T. Scopes was 
put up to be this sort of Galileo or, you know, um, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh kind of figure, the one man who sees the truth and he's being persecuted for it and we got to come to his aid. So Northern lawyers from Chicago and New York come down, the radio comes down to poke fun at the Southern bumpkins who were, you know, dumb and uneducated and toothless and everything else. And Southerners start to say, Yankees, you need to go back to the North to your wicked cities where they have vice and all the bad stuff there and quit telling us how to live our lives. And it was a perfect encapsulation of America at war with itself, urban versus rural, Northern versus Southern, um, cosmopolitan and, and uh, you know, um, diverse versus homogenous and very traditional and religious. And it was on display in a huge way there. Okay, I'm gonna skip the next slide because there's some economic stuff in there that's kind of interesting, but I'm running out of time as I can see by the, the clock there. I'm gonna start third period or fourth period, I should say pretty quick in about a half an hour. So I wanna to skip to the last slide here so we can talk about um, culture in the 20s because there's some really interesting stuff going on in America at this time. Um, first is that there was this movement known as the Harlem Renaissance that Harlem was the largest um, black neighborhood basically in America. Now, African-Americans had lived in um, you know, Northern Manhattan for centuries since the 1620s. Um, free blacks and slaves had lived in New York. New York would then ban slavery and the free black population would increase, but it really exploded in the teens and 20s because of World War I. And then because of that chain migration, more and more African-Americans were moving up every day because it was nice to live in the North. You could vote, your kids could go to a good school, you had electricity, your wages were higher. Um, it was a lot better than the South for sure. So in the South, there were no like black owned recording studios or radio stations or newspapers. You weren't allowed to have those things. And so when you went to the North, white folk didn't really care that much if you did it. And so African-Americans started opening up their own restaurants with their own ethnic cuisine, soul food. Um, it catches on in the North. Northerners, white Northerners start to go to these restaurants like Sylvia's in, um, in New York City in Harlem. Um, all these theaters open up like the, you know, um, the Cotton Club um, uh, and the Apollo. And it's very weird. These are theaters where the audience is white and like white folks will like travel by subway. Uh, some white folks from Europe will cross the Atlantic Ocean to hear jazz music because nobody had heard of it. And you go and you're sitting in a theater where everyone's white and blacks aren't allowed to be there, but they're allowed to be up on stage entertaining. It's very weird. Um, but that was what was considered acceptable. It wasn't okay for the races to mix in terms of romance or dating or you know anything like that. But you could have black people as servants work in your home and you could have black people entertain you in movies or on stage. Now, Southerners, so Southern whites were so against that they didn't even want black culture influencing them, but Northern whites, it was okay. So this music started to proliferate. This wonderful jazz music, black literature, like poems of Langston Hughes, um, uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Um, there was this sort of huge movement here where it was just unleashed for the longest time. Black people had this wonderful culture in America, but it had been, you know, suppressed. And now it was coming to the surface because Harlem was free in a way. And of course, radio fueled this and everything else at the time. At the time, um, New York City became sort of the unofficial capital of the world. Now. London and Paris, you know, still might have a claim to that at the time, certainly after World War II, New York City is the center of the world, right? Um, so for example, entertainment. You guys probably very well know that you go to New York City, they have Broadway. All the best musicals are written in America, they're performed on Broadway, and then they go off to other places. I remember taking a group of students in 2012 to London to the West End, to the theater district, and all the students saw Wicked. In 2013, Hamilton wasn't around yet. Lin-Manuel Miranda was still writing it. And so we all saw Wick Wicked is written in America. It was performed on Broadway. It went to the Pantages on the West Coast, and then it went to London afterwards. And British people and French people are watching our musicals. It was the reverse before the 1920s. I told you in the 1870s, people would go and see Gershwin musicals written in Britain about you know, the British Navy and Americans ate that stuff up. Now there's all American um, people like uh, George Gershwin or Rodgers and Hammerstein writing musicals like Oklahoma or Rhapsody in Blue or An American in Paris. And these musicals just take 
New York by storm, and then they go overseas. So New York City is sort of the center of global culture. It's very weird. You can go and see an African-American band performing in front of white audiences, this new type of music jazz, these new type of dances that white people didn't know before. It was kind of a blending of different cultures. It was free, it was liberating, but you couldn't get a glass of beer at the same time. It was very bizarre, the sort of, you know, dualism going on at the time. Um, coupled with that is the fact that New York City now became the banking center of the world. It used to be London, but World War I had bankrupted Great Britain. U.S. now was the largest lender nation on earth, and all the biggest banks on earth were in New York. Um, Wall Street, right? So Wall Street and Broadway, those two streets are now symbolic of entertainment, but also banking. Now, we always had rich bankers, you know, we had John Jacob Astor in the 1820s and 30s, we had, you know, J.P. Morgan in the 1890s and early 1900s, but those guys were always second to the Rothschild family of, of London or other huge banking families. Now, American banks were by far the richest in the world, and other countries would go to our banks to bail them out and to get loans. So the U.S. became this global superpower at the time. Um, at the same time, probably, in my opinion, I'm no literary critic, but this to me is the best literary movement that America ever spawned. Um, now, if you actually talk to people who know, who are literature majors, they will say, you know, probably the transcendentalist movement of the 1850s was better. This is when you had books like Moby Dick um, written by um, Herman Melville. You had Ralph Waldo Emerson. You had uh, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson. Um, I've tried reading these books, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter, and to me, they're kind of old timey and a little slow and boring. I like the books of the 20s though. I've read a few of them. I've read a, quite a few of Ernest Hemingway's books. I like them a lot. Um, the Sun Also Rises, um, A Movable Feast, my, probably one of my favorite books of all time is, uh, uh, um, oh, Not a Farewell to Arms, what's the other one? Um, one about the Spanish Civil War. Oh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, wonderful book. Um, likewise with Fitzgerald, he wrote The Great Gatsby, considered to be the second greatest novel ever written by an American, Moby Dick being first. But every time I pick up Moby Dick, I'll read five pages and I say, this is so old timey, it's like inaccessible. I don't know how to relate to it. You can read Great Gatsby and one wonderful thing about it, even if you don't like Gatsby, short, it's only like 185 pages. You can read it in three or four hours. And it's a wonderful, beautiful book with a lot of great symbolism and metaphors in there. Um, it's wonderful. So all these great writers are writing at this time. Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, H.L. Uh, Mencken, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot wrote The Wasteland, this great poem about the sort of future apocalypse. Um, and so the overwhelming theme of this literature is what's called disillusionment. Now, if you never felt disillusionment, that's a good thing. Um, disillusionment is the feeling that you thought you were operating under a certain reality and then someone blows up that reality, right? Like you thought there was a just and merciful God who would never let a great war happen. And then you went to the you know, uh, front lines in 1917 and 1918, you saw the carnage and the destruction and it shattered your faith. A lot of Americans come and, and Europeans too come home and say, what kind of just and merciful God could, could allow such slaughter? This is terrible. Or you might say, I thought democracy was the best system in the world. And the, it's always the war that typically is disillusioning people. Sometimes it's other things. It's, it's the conservative backlash of the anti-immigrant uh, sentiment or the KKK or whatever. And people just, they sort of lose faith. And they just say, I thought I was living in, in this wonderful advanced utopia and it's not that great. So you get a lot of these interesting American expat communities or expatriate communities they're called where a lot of American intellectuals will move and live in Europe for a long time, right? A lot of American celebrities do. Johnny Depp lives in the South of France. A lot of writers will do this. They get kind of jaded with America and they'll go live in another country for a while because they say, I thought I had all the answers and I became disillusioned. And this is sort of the, the ethos, the spirit of all of this literature that you read. It's kind of depressing, but for some reason, good art is always kind of depressing. Comedies never win best picture, right? It's always tragedies, dramas that do. Going on to the last thing, politics. So. Um, at the end of the 20s, we have three Republican administrations. We have Warren Harding, who dies two years into office, but Calvin Coolidge takes over. Calvin Coolidge is elected in 24. And then we have the great uh, Hoover-Smith election of 1928, and Herbert Hoover wins that as well. So three Republican administrations. It seemed like the Democrats did not know what they were doing. This 
weird amalgamation of two halves of the Democratic Party did not get along. It was always tricky, right? Ever since the early 1800s, when Jefferson founded the Republican Party that then became the Jacksonian Democrats, it was always um, a weird mixture of people together, but they somehow held it together. By the 1890s, this was becoming very difficult. Um, if you remember the um, mckinley Bryan election of 1896, this is what did in William Jennings Bryan. He was a very talented and capable figure who had a great message, but he represented sort of white rural farmers who were part of the Democratic Party. And then the other half was urban immigrants and, and sons and daughters of immigrants. He didn't know how to reach out to these people. He made fun of these people. He criticized these people. And it was kind of like, dude, why are you criticizing half of your base? You know, he gave a very fiery speech where he said, if uh, you evacuated the cities, if nobody lived in the cities anymore, the countryside would be fine. We don't need you. But if the countryside evaporated, the cities would grow over with weeds and grass. Everyone would starve to death. You need us more than we need you. And it was kind of this feeling that cities had all this power. You hear a lot of conservatives talk about this today. What are they so mad about in rural areas, right? Because people like me would say, Wyoming, why are you so mad and angry that you feel you're disenfranchised? You have two senators and we have two senators. You're many times more powerful. To me, the power tilts in your favor. And they'll always mention that you guys have Hollywood. Uh, New York City has all the banks, the coastal elites control the country, we don't control anything in the center. And conservatives felt that way in the teens and 20s as well. And so um, Brian didn't know how to square that circle and make those two halves agree. He insulted the cities. And by the way, he was wrong about that, right? What are farmers going to produce and sell if they're not selling to hungry mouths and cities who have a lot of money? They're, they're mutually dependent on each other. We need each other. We need more of that kind of talk. But for some reason, politicians like to pit us against each other. Smith was the evolution of this. He represented the other half of the Democratic Party. He was a Irish Catholic. He was not an immigrant, but the son of an immigrant. Um, and he was a big city New Yorker. He had served as mayor of New York City and then governor of New York State. He was one of the first people to campaign on radio and he had a very thick New York accent that was very off-putting to a lot of people. He smoked cigars, he drank during prohibition and bragged about it and just said, you know, this is a silly law. Everything that small town conservatives just hated. This is one of the ugliest campaigns uh, in American history. Um, Al Smith was certain that he would win the South because the South had been solidly democratic forever, but he was kind of worried about the Midwest and other areas. So he campaigned there. He made kind of a token, you know, swing through the South. They did not like him. He went down to many Southern states to try to uh, give speeches to them and try to campaign. And the KKK burned crosses to welcome his train and tell him, get the hell out of our town. We don't like you. Now, why did they hate Smith so much? Largely because he was Catholic. Um, it's rather amazing when you think about it because today this seems bizarre to us. But after African-Americans, Native Americans, um, you know, Catholics are one of the most discriminated against group in the history of the US. First the Irish, and then the Italians, and then today, you know, people from Latin America. Um, the discrimination today isn't largely because of Catholicism, it's more ethnic and racial reasons and cultural reasons. But in any case, um, anti-Catholic sentiment was just so ugly in this election. There were pamphlets passed out all over the country that said, we can't elect a Catholic. If Al Smith is elected, he's gonna give a pope, the Pope an office in the White House and he's gonna open the floodgates of immigration. Now, some people said, well, that's silly. You know, he's, He can't do that because even if he does win the presidency, the Congress would have to change the laws. And this conspiracy theory was hatched that the Vatican right now in Rome had dug this tunnel that went all the way under the Atlantic Ocean and it was ready to come up underneath the White House and just let all these poor people. It was, a, it, it was considered to be a plot, a popish plot that the, the Catholic Church was trying to rid Europe of all these poor, desperate people, flood America, and destroy it with its unwanted poor masses, which was absurd and ridiculous and ugly. But that's what they said about Al Smith, that he would give the Pope uh, an office in the White House and that he had this secret underground tunnel he was planting under the ocean, just absurd stuff. So it didn't start with Obama and, and people saying he wasn't born in America, which was ugly and awful. And I remember all that. And it was terrible. But 
unfortunately, America has a long history of this, is sort of otherizing people that are just a little different than the mainstream waspy Protestant America. Al Smith was never able to square that circle, just like Brian. He couldn't get rural Democrats to reach out to him. They were very resentful that their party had been taken over by big city immigrants. And they just said, you know, we've always been the party of immigrants, and that was fine as long as we, you know, they were in big cities and we were down here in rural southern states. But now you've taken over the party and, and you are making all the national decisions and you want alcohol and we don't. You like jazz music and we hate it. And so Al Smith went down to, to defeat in this election. Hoover won very easily. It was a huge landslide election. At Hoover's inaugural address, he gave a speech where he said, Americans have led the way, every other country is reeling from World War I and we are closer today to conquering poverty than any other nation in the history of humankind and its Republican policies that have gotten us here, we need to stay the course. Four years later, Hoover would be thrown out of office and America would be in the worst depression ever in its history and it would spread globally and we were not close to ending poverty at all. So, oops, a little bit of a, a, a mischaracterization of what was going on there, right, uh, Hoover? So, um, that's the 20s. It was an interesting time. I know I kind of sped through that a little quickly, but um, I went, skipped through slide five there kind of quickly, but uh, that's okay. Um, I won't, you know, question you guys on that stuff. I might bring it up later when we get to the 30s. I can always add on to it, but that's the 20s. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, listen to some old 20s music, some Billie Holiday, Jimmy Rogers, and some great stuff. All right, guys. Um, I will see you next time. We'll get into the Great Depression of the 30s. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.